Dr. Jonathan Sarfati is not a stranger to many of you because I've interviewed him before. Uh, he is a prolific author. It seems every time I turn around there's a new book by him. Uh, and if not book, another article. In fact, Jonathan, I was looking at a recent compilation of your articles. And there must be about 10 pages of articles in small mm -hmm. print that you've written. I really wonder, uh, you know, what you do in your spare time. Uh, what spare time? <laughs> I was going to say, what spare time do well, you have? Of course, I do, I do play chess. That's still a hobby of mine, right. even though I don't play it as serious as, as, I, as I did when I was younger. But yeah, chess is one thing I have. Well, unlike, time. but we, yeah. should, we should qualify. You, you, you'll, you'll, pay, you'll play 12, 15, 20 people at a time, blindfolded, I hear. I've played 12 people blindfold. Uh, last, yesterday I played 30 people sighted because there wasn't someone who could uh, call the moves out reliably, so right. we had to switch to sighted so I could handle more that way. Now, when you play, yeah. play 30, 30 people, uh, do you beat them all? Yes, last night I did, beat yes. Them. <laughs> well, I'm staggered by your intellectual capability and, uh, and, and the amount of detail in your writing is just uh, phenomenal. You truly are... Uh, prolific. Uh, this book that I um, am highlighting, uh, one of many that you've written, is Refuting Compromise. And essentially what you're doing in the book is you're uh, refuting the, um, uh, the tendency of uh, a number of Christians mm -hmm. and uh, many of the evangelical Christians to follow a certain school of thought that says that the that, that, that essentially accommodates the, environment, the um, evolutionary uh, perspective on, on the world and yeah. says that we're looking at millions, billions uh, of years for everything to take, sh take shape and it's kind of uh, folded into the Genesis account by referring either to um, uh, a long day or a gap theory or whatever. Why, why is this important to you uh, to refute this? Well, it's a case of what is our authority. You see, um, is our authority the, the Word of God, the Bible, or is it something outside the Bible, the ever-changing theories of fallible science? And this is where it comes in. And, and all the long-age views were never thought of in the, in the church until the rise of long-age science. You can look at the commentaries. That's what I did in my book, Chapter 3. I talk about how the early church understood Genesis, how the Reformers understood it, and they all um, were, were um, unanimous. The world is about 6,000 years old, um, 4,000 BC creation date. That's what they got from the text of Scripture. Only when you bring in other ideas from outside of Scripture do you get these millions of years. The thing is, they think they're going to win the atheists over that way, but um, all the atheists realize is that the, the atheists are winning them over. And the thing is, okay, we can get you to, to abandon Genesis 1 now, but what, we, what tomorrow we'll get you to abandon the resurrection because science says that dead men don't rise and virgins don't conceive. And so where does it stop? Mm. So you've written at great length, uh, you name names, and I don't think we need to name names here on the show, but uh, you're, you're very, very, I mean, you have an instinct for the jugular. <laughs> you really do. And as I was reading this book, I, many times, I go, whoa, that, boy, that one hit the mark. But there's a lot of positive aspects to the book that I uh, was very impressed with. And, and one of them, um, uh, under the chapter entitled The Authority of Scripture, uh, you talk about science as being a result of creationist theology. Uh, now, that's got to be a bit of a revelation to everybody. Uh, wh what, are you, what are you thinking here? Well, in fact, it's not actually a revelation to those who study the origin of science. In fact, one like Joseph Needham, he went to, to China to work out why did Europe overtake China after about 1000 AD. And he reluctantly came to the conclusion because the Europeans had a basically Christian worldview of the idea of a divine lawmaker. Because unless you have this idea of an orderly creation, you're not going to get modern science. But in fact, this follows from the biblical teaching that we have a God of order. And also he gave us the dominion mandate um, whereby we are instructed to to make use of, of the created uh, world for our our benefits uh, as well so these two things led to this rise of the mo of modern science even in the middle ages uh, you had quite a scientific revol uh, revolution going on, which is usually ignored. But you think about um, all the Middle Ages inventions we had, uh, wind power and water power, the heavy plow, and the, the stirrups, printing press, gunpowder. These are all Middle Ages inventions. And I, I see you're wearing a Middle Ages invention as well. Yeah. You see, that optics was discovered in the 1200s in the monasteries. And then uh, later on, after I wrote the first edition of that book, um, discoveries about the Reformation and how the objective understanding of the Bible that was recovered in the Reformation carried over into an objective understanding of nature. So they decided to look, let's look at what nature does. 
because God is sovereign. He can create how he pleases. Therefore, let's see how he actually runs the world. Instead of deciding how he ought to run it, we just see how he has run it. Now, now you, you say here in this chapter, and you've just already alluded to it, that uh, there is such a thing as objective truth. Now, yes. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, with all of the talk lately, well, over the last 10 years or so about postmodernism, mm -hmm. if the postmodern generation are producing any scientists, because uh, for them, truth is what you perceive, mm -hmm. and what's true for you is not necessarily true for me. Mm -hmm. This idea of absolute or objective truth uh, just doesn't jive with the, uh, uh, at least the, the climate of the last 10 or 15 years. Um, mm -hmm. is, is the younger generation buying into this objective truth uh, reality? Well, uh, it is a problem trying to do science without uh, uh, objective truth, and yet, of course, the Bible teaches objective truth because God uh, is the way, the truth, and the life. That's yeah. Jesus Christ himself. Um, now, postmodernism is a problem. And in fact, one uh, physics professor wrote a, a, a parody, a postmodernist view of quantum mechanics and gravity, and got it published in a, in a postmodern journal. And of course, it was, it was a complete hoax, but he just showed how what, uh, um, the, the emperor has no clothes. Right. He, he, got, he was trying to hoax them to see if it passed and must. It was a complete load of nonsense, written to be a complete load of nonsense, but because it, it said all the right buzzwords that postmodernists like to hear, it got published. There's a guy called Sokal who wrote yeah. this. It's really quite an amusing um, story. Did they realize it was a parody as they were reading? No, no, they was a publisher. They, gave it, they took it seriously. It that so shows that you, you say the right buzzwords, that's all they care about, yeah. even if you talk a load of nonsense. I mean, the idea that somehow gravity is a postmodern thing. Well, you try jumping off a cliff, it doesn't matter what you believe, you're going to fall. That's okay, right. yeah. There is something objective out there. And yeah. this is what the Bible teaches. There is an objective reality that God created. Yeah, and the universe is real. That's an important thing, yeah. Yeah. And of course, postmodernism refutes itself because you say there is no such thing as truth. Is that statement itself true? Well, yeah. <laughs> and then, as you've already said, the universe is orderly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, the, and you've alluded to this as well, but I, I'd like you to build this a bit. The uh, perspective of the, if you will, the early fathers of, of science mm -hmm. was that uh, this was a sovereign God yeah. who uh, was behind everything and could do what he chose to do. Yes, he would be a god of order, but in fact the, the particular order or natural laws as they were described as would depend on what he actually chose. I mean, Aristotle's philosophy said that heavy objects fall faster than light objects. Well, people in the Middle Ages before Galileo decided to test that see what actually happens. And of course, apart from air resistance, they fall at the same speed. You see, that's what we mean. Let's look at nature objectively and let uh, God, uh, by finding out how God is actually running the show. And is it true too that most of the, uh, if you will, the blue chip universities, let alone education in general, uh, was founded uh, by people who had a biblical worldview. Well, I think universities themselves were an invention in the Middle Ages. They grew out of the theological colleges. That's the whole point. They were founded a, as a, a branch of a theological college. And think of uh, in the United States, Harvard and Yale founded expressly to give glory to God and Christ. But of course, now they've uh, totally abandoned their Christian uh, roots. And therefore, it's not surprising that you have things like um, fraud, even in places like Harvard because they've abandoned the biblical basis for telling the truth. Mm.